Now we do welcome all of you to our service this evening. Uh, we want to say thank you for coming and for those who are visiting with us. Uh, we're glad to have you and for those who are here for the first time. Uh, we're, we're especially delighted. Make yourself known to us and we'll make ourselves known to you as well. And for those who are back again, uh, uh, who, who are uh, visitors, you again are most Welcome. Now, do remember there's supper immediately after the service tonight, so there's no need for anybody to go away. We, we are especially delighted to have uh, one of our first year students with us, uh, a Mr. Paul Backhurst. You're very welcome, Paul, uh, and his wife, Ariana, and their six children, uh, Joshua and Calvin and Talisha and Boaz and Thomas and baby Rosie. See, I've got their names already, I've got them written down here in case I would forget them, but I was speaking to the children uh, coming down in the car and it was lovely just to be able to do that and to have fellowship with them. So thank you for coming uh, as a family. Uh, they're living in the Manson Cross Gar at the moment and I'm sure I didn't say to uh, the clerk of session there, Mr Gill, they'll all be away this Sunday night, uh, but uh, I'm sure he'll be thankful at least that they're together and they're able to have fellowship. Uh, so we're especially delighted to have them and I'm going to ask the Lord's servant if he'll come and give us a word of personal testimony and tell us how he got saved and tell us about his call a wee bit into the Whitfield College of the Bible. The Lord bless you, Paul. Could we turn together uh, to a portion of God's word and that's in the New Testament and that's in the first letter that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. First Corinthians and then looking at chapter 6. Chapter 6. First Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> and we're going to look at a couple of verses on that at the moment. And then look at a third verse uh, later on. So you can keep your fingers in the Bible uh, once we finish reading these two verses. And we're going to look at verses uh, 9 and 10 of the 6th chapter of the 1st Corinthians. <coughs> Verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, <coughs> nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. I was born in Cyprus. My father was in the RAF in the early 70s. And, but I'm still British, born in a sovereign British area universe, um, hospital. Uh, but I was brought up in Liverpool uh, with my mother and my sister, my father having, having left us at a, an early age. We were brought up uh, going to the church. My mother was a, brought up herself a strict Lutheran in, in a Scandinavian country. And so we were taken to the church once a day or twice a day on the Lord's Day depending on what was available. Unfortunately, I would say, looking back, we went to an Anglican church, which originally had a fairly orthodox minister uh, there, but in the, low, in the course of time, a, a, a modernist, a liberal, came in and took the helm and took it downhill, which is what I myself experienced and understood at the time as a young man. I made a confession of faith a number of times as a young man, at the age of... 12, uh, when uh, Billy Graham came to the UK with Mission England, I remember going down, not really being convinced of my need of Christ, but to be honest, more of a need of having the information pack that you'd get and being interested in that. And I was religious for a short time, for a few months, even as a young man of 11, but that petered out. Later on, when I was about 16, there was a, a teacher at school and he became he became a Christian, he was known as an atheist, and, um, and now he's, uh, he's, still, he's still the chemistry, no, he's now re retired as the chemistry teacher, and, um, 
and he's fairly well known amongst uh, science teachers in England, Mr. Nick Cowan, and uh, and he is a, a staunch defendant of the Bible's record of how everything is made, creationism, even having had a, a re, um, televised debate with uh, Dawkins, of all people, or an interview at least. So in that milieu, in that environment, and with that sort of charismatic side, I started going to extracurricular meetings on the Thursday evening at school and got in touch with that sort of thing, believing I was a Christian and getting involved with the meetings. Um, however, once I was 18 and 19, I left that all behind me and showed the fruits of a false conversion. And the fruits were bitter. They were not good. A life of sin, a life of not seeking God, seeking anything but and I wasn't indifferent to the gospel I was vehemently anti-gospel I was very much a, a hater of Christians and the Bible in fact even at university I remember using as my thesis uh, an argument to try to disprove the, the gospel and the Christ of the Bible so deep was my hatred towards my own saviour so I was 32, I had moved to Holland, I was, as I said, an unbeliever, and very much so. I, if I was in contact with Christians, I did not like them, I did not like being in their company. As I said, I wasn't indifferent. And so at the age of 32, living in Holland for a couple of years, I went back to Liverpool where my mum, where we were brought up, it was my mum's birthday. and. Unfortunately, as I thought then, we had to go to church on the Sunday. But I knew I had nothing to fear. The strange discernment that even an unbeliever has about where to go and where to avoid what the, go what the gospel's concerned. And so we sat under the sermon. But unfortunately for me, or fortunately for my soul, there was a gospel preacher there that evening. Someone who knew something of the gospel. And he explained it in very low-key terms, very easy terms for anybody to understand. And as I was sitting there, I was thinking to myself, oh, no, he's right. It's not just a social club. We don't just come here to be good, as it were, and, and, just, and just to think ourselves better than other people. There's a reason why we're here. And his surname was Godson. And he said, you all have to become as I am, God's son. You'll have to become a child of God, and that's a work of God. And it was, as I said, it was a very low-key gospel, and it was very easy to understand. And as I was thinking there, I was thinking, he's right. He's absolutely right. If you're stupid enough... To believe this rubbish was my attitude. But strangely enough, I didn't hate him. I didn't have that venom uh, welling up inside of me, as was usual when having contact with such men. And after the service, he spoke to us, and he was very pleased to speak to me, and he was asking me, he said, Paul, um, so um, have you ever believed then, having me, took me having told him that I didn't believe? I said yes when I was a teenager, when I was young, but I've grown up. I don't need that anymore. And he says, well, Paul, you may have given up on the Lord Jesus Christ, but the Lord Jesus Christ has not given up on you. And if any, if any words ever struck me deep and made me fearful, it was those words. And he said to me, Paul, have you ever read the book of Romans? I said, sure, I must have done at some point. And he said, Paul, read it. Will you read it for me? Will you promise that you'll read it? I said, yes, yeah, sure, I'll do it. And for some reason, I acquiesced. I said, yes, I promised. And I, I still like the man for some reason. So I went back to the Netherlands, and during that week, the, the Lord was at work in me. And in a ways that I had to, you know, in the back of my head, confess to myself, you know, there's something weird going on. The enmity, the, 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 the hatred towards God and Christ and Christians, that, 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 that had melted away. And I remember talking to a colleague who was a confessing Christian. And he was, he was talking to me about... Uh, in fact, he said very little, but he was just encouraging me to talk about what I was experiencing. And I was very careful, but I had to admit, something was going on. And by the time Thursday came, it's like four days now, I needed that Bible. I needed to read that book of Romans. And he knew where I could buy one, an English language Bible in, in Holland. And so he took me to the, to the bookshop and we bought a Bible. And I took it home and I opened the covers of the Bible and I just, I, had, I felt so strange. And I just devoured 16 chapters of Romans in one evening and was so deeply convinced that this book 
this, this letter written to the Romans by Paul was personally written to me. I thought it was fine that the Christian church had had it for 2,000 years, but it was personally written to me. Not that everything was applicable to me, not that I understood everything, not that I, that I understand everything now, but it was so personal to me. And, and I remember being quite confused, but quite gobsmacked, as we say in Liverpool, by all of this. I mean, somebody who was not looking for Christ, somebody who was looking for his salvation in more in Buddhism and in, and in other things, for then the Lord to turn around and literally pull me out of the pit. Very strange. On the Friday night, so this is five days, six days after hearing the gospel presentation, I remember ringing up my mum and explaining to her what was happening. It's really weird what's happening, mum. And my mum had been praying for me diligently for years and years and years, that the Lord would have mercy and open these sin-blinded eyes. And she was very happy. I said, mum, <laughs> don't jump the gun. I said, I'm just, something's happening and I have to admit it's something to do with God. And so I asked her to pray for me. So mum, will you pray for me? And she willingly did so. And we put, I put the phone down and I went to bed. And I just had this image in front of me of someone offering you a million euros. <coughs> I was in Europe, you say. A million euros. Or somebody was going to put a dagger in your belly. That was it. That was the choice. You, ha you were allowed to make a choice of one of those two. Th you had to make the choice between one of those two things. Either receive a million euros or be stabbed in the belly, leading to death. And so that choice of, of immense riches and death, it was to me, you know, there's only one choice to make. There's only one choice to make. Not, not the choice for money, no, but to choose not for death, to choose for riches, to choose for what is good. And I knew that it was to do with Christ. And even though at university I'd read books to try to dis. To, to try to deny the true existence of Christ and, and reading anything just to confirm me in my sin. And that was in my prayer. I said, I'm going to pray. I prayed. I said, you know, God, I don't know. I know I've got to repent of my sins and I want to repent of my sins. And I want forgiveness. And I want faith. Strange for such a, a, an atheist, a God-hating atheist to, to realize that I needed forgiveness and I needed faith in God. And I remember praying to the Lord, said, Lord, I'm not even too sure that Jesus was a true historical figure, but give me faith and forgive me my sins. And I went to sleep and I slept well. And I woke up the next morning and this morning sticks in my mind because I woke up with joy in my heart. I mean, seriously, just joy, happiness. And it wasn't brought into my body by an ex external thing, by, by drink or anything else, or something happening, uh, 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 entertainment or a distraction. But this was just joy welling up inside me. And my first thoughts when I woke was, I'm a Christian. With a big smile on my face and just happy. Yes, I'm a Christian. And this is just black and white. That is not Paul Backhurst that anybody knew. And, and confessing it during that day or sharing it to other people who knew me. As I was helping someone that day, I was saying, I've become a Christian. And, and just the reaction was, what, you, Paul, you? No, 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 no. I said, honestly, it's serious. I have become a Christian. So people even knew me. They knew my foul mouth. And my, my, my colleagues at work started uh, hassling my Christian colleague after a week, saying, what have you done to Paul? I said, he's, rest, he's, 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 um, he's relaxed. He doesn't swear all the time. You know, what have you done to him? And so it, it's good that you have a testimony and it's good that the Lord is pleased to work through sinners as foolish and stupid as I was and as foolish and stupid as I still can be. He's still pleased to save those a people who are not his people to call them his people. And so I'm, I stand here as a, still a sinner but a redeemed sinner and a sanctified sinner and he's been made righteous because God, when he looks at me, he looks at Jesus Christ and he sees that righteousness that Jesus Christ has. Non -right no, I've got no righteousness of my own, but I have Christ's righteousness. Amen. So when, she, when the Lord looks at me, he can look at me with no wrath. No, I'm no longer a child of wrath because I was. And it doesn't matter how filthy your sins are or how private your sins are, how, how public or how small you may think that they are. They might not even come into that list that we read in, in verses 9 and 10. No, they might be very civilized sins, 
But it's not your sin. It's not how good your sin is, how big it is, how corrupt and immoral it is. It's against whom you have sinned. A holy and eternal God has been offended and you have hated him and turned your back on him. And yet there is salvation in him. So that is two points of sin and salvation. And if we quickly look at verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 6. And such were some of you. I put my hand in the air. But, oh one of those beautiful buts that are in the Bible. Ye are washed. But ye are sanctified. And as I've just mentioned, but ye are justified. In the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Shortly after my conversion... I would say about 10 months afterwards, having got involved in a, a fellowship, I considered the desire, or had the desi- desire to learn of the Word of God and to know more about it and to maybe even preach. And yet there was a verse from uh, uh, the fir- in the, the letter of James, chapter 3 and verse 1, and that warning stuck in my head, and it actually stayed in my head for the last 10, 11 years is my brethren be not many masters, be not many teachers of the gospel, not many preachers that means, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Don't just stand in a pulpit and say anything that comes into your heart because God is going to set you by the standard of his word and is going to measure you very exactly. Are you giving giving pure milk or are you giving rat poison, which is 90% or 99% good food, but 1% which is deadly? Are you going to be... are you going to be, have to stand before God and be accused of being a false teacher? That stood in my head. So I knew I needed to get training. And I knew I had to go somewhere where the Bible was believed. But they are not to a penny. I remember scouring Holland, where I was living, looking at various places that I could, that I could study and not finding anything. And Ariana is my witness, my wife, whom the Lord uh, brought into my life in the first two years of my, uh, conver- after my conversion. And... We were looking and looking at various places and just the, the taste, the, the, the smell, the, the atmosphere that, you know, we're reading what they were trying to say. All say that they follow Christ. All say that they want to preach the gospel. And yet it doesn't always turn out like that. And so we were looking at seminaries, uh, Protestant seminaries, of course. We were looking at Bible colleges, even on the UK mainland. And eventually, in the Lord's will, and this has been in me a, a, whole, a whole time, a whole process of of change and sanctification Um, because of course 10 11 years ago I thought I I was ready I was ready to do it then but the Lord knows better I knew I wasn't ready and there were so many things that had to be dealt with in my life and so it was pleased the Lord in 2013 December I was watching on sermon audio was most of my contact with the free church I've been to Liverpool a few times so I've met some elders there and Calvin Strip was the minister there I'd met him a few times and so we're watching that um, The Easter conference, and Mr. Ferguson was talking about the fact that this college also has external students. Now, my ears pricked up, and I went straight onto my knees and started praying. Yes, Lord, please, please. Something I had been praying out for many years uh, about the possibility of the doors opened, and that was the door just being opened, a little crack. And again, that was with much prayer and um, studying of the scriptures to see the Lord's answer and his guidance. And so it pleased the Lord, after having received an offer in 2014, to bring us in the end of 2015 to, uh, to Crosscar, as it turned out. I mean, we were looking all over the place, expecting it to be in Warringstown still, the college, or Lawrencetown. And so finally, uh, he brought us here, with many hurdles in the way, financial hurdles, physical hurdles. But the Lord opened the doors, and the Lord provided somebody who... who who paid for the removal ban, van who, and two colleagues volunteered to come with me and unload everything. Um, there's a list of things that the Lord has provided for at the moment, at that moment, not only to, to confirm um, that I'm being brought to study, but to comfort my wife and family, especially my wife. You know, she, she's, you know she's import. She's, she's been brought in. She's on her own. You know, the, you know, the, the only Dutch speakers are, are the seven people in the house around her. You know, so it's a challenge for her, but it comforted her. And it, and it gave her confidence, yet, that this is the Lord's way for her and for us as a family. You know, I'm not called apart from my family. You know, my first office is as husband, my second as father. And the Lord is pleased to give another office 
in his own will, then that is part and parcel of who we are as a family. Can I just say something about the college? As I said, Bible-believing and gospel teaching and preaching uh, Bible colleges are not to a penny. And I would, I would very much plead with you um, to take the Whitfield College onto your, I'm sure it is, but onto your prayer list and to pray for it. To pray for God's protecting grace and for God's blessing upon the work. Because having been in a number of reformed congregations or, or reformed denominations, I've almost finished, reformed denominations in Holland and, and, and done lots of research, the rot begins most often in the colleges, in the Bible colleges. You might not see it for 20 years, but that's where it begins. And we as people are so easily we go astray. It's our nature. It's our nature. If God just brings his hand of grace just a little bit away from us, we start to rot on the inside and it will become visible eventually. So I will plead with you because I have been very much encouraged by what I've seen and experienced in the college in the last six months of, of godly men teaching the ways of God. Please pray that God will keep his hand on the college. Amen. That he will help us students, especially during the exams time, which are extremely <laughs> intense and almost vicious, I would say. Very intense. Having done university, this is at least twice as difficult. Um, <laughs> I know. So pray for us, but especially pray for the Lord's grace on the college, that he will continue to bless, protect, and keep us in the boundaries of his word. Bless all the men that teach, and that he will guide and that he will bring forth labourers to work in his vineyard. Remember, my story tonight is to give honour to Christ Jesus and not to me. And those who are outside of Christ, whether their sins are big or small, are guilty before God and are dead in God's sight. Because sin has killed you. And it will kill you. And that death, that second death, is an everlasting death. The two words for everlasting are joined with everlasting in the Bible. Yeah? The first is everlasting life. That doesn't stop after 10 years. Everlasting death. Hell doesn't stop after 10 years. It's everlasting. Because the God that we have offended is everlasting. And his wrath will be satisfied. But loves, please, let it be satisfied on the cross of Christ in your name. And not upon your eternal body for corruption. Turn to Jesus. He is good. He is kind. And his blood will wash away all sins that you've ever done. Amen. Well, we do thank uh, Paul for coming tonight and uh, sharing with us, telling us a little bit about his conversion to Christ and his call to the Whitfield College of the Bible. As he's already asked, do remember him in prayer. Uh, remember his wife, Ariana, uh, and the six children. I'm very especially delighted.